I was beginning to think that I would never see this day, but it is indeed the finale of Season 19 of The Lord of the Rings Online. East Rohan is finished for now. And I, I think I've already rambled enough about all the difficulties I had getting this season out, but I do want to take just one final opportunity to apologize to you guys that 2020 was a little slow, and hopefully this year, here in 2021, I'll be uploading much more consistently. I appreciate your patience. Anyways, let's get on with the finale. As you know by now, I do like to follow a template with it. So first thing I want to do is remind you to head on over to renaissancegaming.net slash lochohtml and you can see my completionist checklist for the series there. For those of you who don't know, this is a 100% playthrough, so I do all the quests and the deeds in the region before moving on to the next one, organized by season. So I did do every single quest here in East Rohan, all the different deeds as well, and you can double check that on my spreadsheet, which I do cross-reference with Locho Wiki, and I spent hours and hours and hours cross-referencing all over the internet to make sure that I don't miss any quests. So that information is pretty accurate, but as always, if you notice anything that may be off or missing, let me know. I appreciate that very much. And next thing is, I do like to go into the next season, which is going to be Wildermore behind me here, with a title from the previous season. So this time around, since I completed East Rohan, I am going to be heading in with Kip and Proudfeet, Thane of the East Eminent. Very exciting. Now, this is what I'm really excited about. It's been a long time since I updated my gear. I do like to update it for every season, but I haven't been doing that just because I've been trying to get content out and there hasn't been good opportunities to upgrade gear, but I've been wearing level 75 gear for way too long and it is long overdue for an overhaul. So I did spend some time kind of getting some stuff here for my character and some of these are rewards and some of these I crafted, some of the stuff I'm gonna keep the same, but regardless, I am gonna be getting an upgrade most notably my first age weapon is now a level 85 weapon. Previously, I had a level 75 one. And it's pretty good. I spent a lot of resources maxing it out. But that's why I level up legendary items as I play. That way I can deconstruct them and get resources exactly for this reason. Now, because it is so expensive in terms of resources to fully upgrade one of these, my javelin is still level 75. And I'm probably not going to upgrade my first age weapons again until I am level 100. That's right, because at 100, you can start to imbue your weapons. At, and that's truly the point in which your first age weapons will be the final weapon you'll ever need. So I think there's another one I can get at level 95. So my level 85 one's already outdated because I'm already level 92. But in terms of first stages, I think there's one more at 95 and then 100. I'm not sure. But either way... I'm not going to upgrade my first stages again until level 100, but I did fully upgrade this level 85 one, and it's going to significantly increase my damage. So, very excited about that, obviously. So, let me go ahead and equip all my new stuff. And then for these rings, I will have to manually drag this second one here. Wrong slot. There you go. And then the bracelet as well. That way it's replacing the right one. This earring, I'm going to... Just replace one of them. I'm still going to be wearing my Olock, which I believe I got in the Tower of Orthanc. It's very good. 300 agility. It's great for a warden. With physical master and critical rating, this is still a very, very good earring. In fact, I wouldn't mind having a second one of these, but... If you guys remember, the ordeal and the struggles I went through to get the Tower of Orthanc done, there is no way in hell I'm going to be doing that again anytime soon. So let me continue putting on some of this new stuff here. And a new... Fist carving, which is great for my warden. So there you go. So my gear is fully upgraded. And I actually nerded out a little bit this time. I didn't just randomly pick gear and hope for the best. I did a lot of math behind it. I actually made a spreadsheet, which I would like to share with you. So here is a spreadsheet that I made. And I didn't try to make it look pretty. It's just trying to be functional. So I know it looks kind of messy to look. And I don't know how well you can see it on your screen. But basically, what I'm doing here is I have a slot for all the items that I wear. So, you know, helmet, shoulder, chest, gloves, legs, boots, cloak, necklace, earrings, bracelets, rings, pocket item, class item, shield, main weapon, ranged weapon. And I have some formulas plugged in here into some of these cells such that I can just plug in the stats of the old item that I have. 
and the new item, and then it automatically calculates the effective bonuses that I get from that item. So, up here, this really doesn't matter much. So, Might, Agility, Vitality, they don't really mean anything by themselves. What I'm really interested in is this part down here. Because, for example, as a Warden, this Agility gets converted... God, what does it get converted to exactly? I forget off the top of my head, but it gets converted to, like, Physical Mastery, and it gets converted to Evade Rating, and so on and so forth. So the agility itself means nothing, it's what it gets converted to that means something. So, once I plug in all these stats, these cells here have formulas that automatically convert everything. So I know, for example, my old helmet, I was getting about 12-15 extra morale, with my new one I'm actually getting less. But, I'm getting much more physical mastery rating, I'm getting a significantly higher critical rating, and so on and so forth. So that way I can easily compare, and going forward in the series, if I come across an item, and it looks kind of similar to what I'm wearing, and I can't really tell if it's going to be better or not, I can just plug in the stats here and see what it spits out at the bottom, and see if it actually is worth it. So, I just wanted to kind of share that with you guys, that... I went ahead and did this, and I'm very meticulous about my gear going forward. Now, this is one sheet of my spreadsheet, and then if I go over here, this basically is calculating all those stats for every single item here. So, the full old build and the full new build. So, you can see that there is quite a significant amount of upgrade that is going on. So... Um, for example, my armor is going to be significantly upgraded with my new stuff. I'm getting about 900 more agility, so on and so forth. Very good. And then again, what I really care about is this stuff here at the bottom. Functionally, how much more morale am I getting? So this is gear only. It doesn't actually calculate my character stats into it. Just the gear itself. So, you know, before my set was giving me about... Almost 15,000 morale, but now it's going to be giving me about 22,500 morale. So, big bonus there. And then here on the right is just a percentage, just a rough calculation. So, with my new set, I'm going to be getting about 52% more morale than my old one. I'm losing 54% power, but it's such a small amount that I was getting. Just 397, that it, that's pretty negligible, even though this percentage seems significant. What's really going to be interesting is physical mastery. I was able to upgrade my physical mastery by about 40%. So you can kind of look through some of this, but it just kind of helps me see how much of an upgrade the new gear is getting me. Now, ultimately, all this I then convert to these mastery ratings to see how effective I'm going to be in combat. So for physical mastery, with my old set, I was getting 180% damage bonus, and now with my new set, I'm getting 199.5, so very significant improvement. And here on the right, you see that there's a cap. So, for example, you can't get your physical mastery rating above 200%. And you may be asking, hey, Renaissance Gaming, you're only level 92, and you're already at 199%. You're almost at cap. You're basically having godlike gear already. That's not true because this scales up. So for example, as I level up from level 92 to level 93, the amount of physical mastery points that I need is going to be higher to get that same 199% if that makes sense. So anyways, you can kind of see that I'm very well upgraded here, which is very exciting. The one thing that I'm confused about though, I will say, is that apparently there is a cap of 25% on critical hit chance however you can see that my critical hit chance with my new armor is 25.8 and it even says that on my character panel in game so i'm not sure if this changed or not but the lotro wiki still says that this is 25 percent if anybody knows let me know in regards to that so okay putting all this together what does this all mean well i want to know how much more damage am i going to be doing and how much more successful am I going to be at defending attacks? So I went ahead and made some formulas here. You can see the formula part up here at the top to calculate my damage. Now, these numbers here are theoretical in terms of I just plugged in some numbers and applied some of these bonuses so I could get some form of a number. And that way I can convert to a percentage of how much better it's going to be. So my theoretical number for my old gear was about 52,000. 
and that same number with my new gear is going to be about 77,000 so that confers a 48% boost to damage so my formulas here are by no means perfect by the way but they I, I put some thought into the math behind this so I think it is going to be fairly accurate it takes everything into account like my critical hit chance how much more damage I'm doing with criticals my finesse rating my physical math it takes into account everything so this should be fairly accurate and so I do expect going into next season I'm going to be doing about 48% more damage which is going to be very exciting and most of that is due to the new first stage weapon that has a stronger baseline damage if you will now I did the same thing here and made a defense formula to calculate my effective defense and again it's not perfect but it should be a fairly accurate representation for example I couldn't really figure out a clever way to incorporate critical defense into the formula so that's left out and you can see it's a little higher with the new gear so just acknowledging that my formulas are not perfect but this does show that I should be about 11% more effective in mitigating damage with my new gear so very exciting 50% more damage more or less and 11% more defense that's really good I hope you guys didn't mind the detour to talk about all this math hopefully some of you guys found that kind of exciting I don't know but let's get back into the game all right now that I've talked about the gear let's go ahead and go into the next season with a new mount as well so i'll probably be using my war steed a lot but i do like to use a new mount in the upcoming season there's no reputation mount here for east rohan so because wildermore is a little bit more of a snowy region i'm actually going to change my cosmetic outfit to some of the snowy ones that i've worn in previous wintry seasons like the Misty Mountains and Forakel and all that. So let's put that on and I'm going to be using my Winter Elk as my mount for the next season. I think I've used this one before, but it'll be nice going into the snowy plains of the Wildermore. All right. Next thing on the finale, I do like to go over my class traits and all that. So I'm still redline and I need to continue working on that. Unfortunately, I really haven't spent the time that I should to really master the Warden, and that's because I'm just going through content. You know, being hyper-specialized and being extremely effective is negligible at this point because really, I can just go in there and do some AoE attacks and be fine. And, you know, there's no point in practicing a super effective rotation under the right skill line here if I'm just killing enemies in like a couple hits anyway, so... I'll really put some more effort into learning the Warden and becoming the best Warden I can possibly be once I am closer to Endgame, but for now I'm just sticking with Red Line for damage. Although, in Endgame it does seem like Yellow Line produces more damage, but again we'll talk about that in the distant future. My race traits, always going to be the same, the most important one of course being my Hobbit Club damage, which essentially gives me a passive plus 5% damage since I'm using a club first stage weapon. And then I got my virtues here, and I'm still sticking with some offensive virtues, um, just so I can power through the content a little bit more quickly. So there is that. So now to get to the meat of the episode, let's talk about all of the deeds in Easter Rohan, and, and there's a lot of them. There's a tremendous amount of them, so let me go to Ro Rovanion here in Eastern Rohan, and you can see I have no active ones because I've completed them all. So... You will see this list is massive because all of the hit bold stuff has deeds associated with it. So I'm not going to specifically be showing every single hit bold deed here because you can just refer back to the previous few episodes in which I did every hit bold quest and deed and all of that. So for example, summons to hit bold, aiding the East Eminent, aiding the Antwash Vale. All these are hit bold type quests, the cottages, the farmhouses, all that stuff. All these in green pretty much are hit bold related deeds that I've shown in the previous few episodes. So then we're getting into the exploration deeds and some of the meta deeds. So Chambers of Bergenstau, Cities of Eastern Rohan, Eastwall Explorer, all this stuff I am going to be showing you momentarily. There are the quests, which I did every quest this season. So of course I got all the deeds for that and I'm not going to specifically be showing that because that's what the whole season was, was me doing all these quests. So here are some meta deeds to do all the 
major D types here in the East Emnet to do all the quests here. And then we got, of course, our Slayer Deeds Ancient Evil Slayer, Beasts, Brigands, Dragon Kinds, Half Forks, all that stuff. So, with all that in mind, let's go ahead and start seeing some of the landmarks in Eastern Rohan for the Exploration Deeds, and then we'll show off some of the Slayer Deeds as well. One thing I do want to mention is that as we go do that, you'll notice that I'm level 92, but in the footage coming up, I'm going to be back at level 91 because I recorded some of that before I finished all the hit bolt stuff while I was still level 91. So I do apologize that I'm 92 now and I'm going to time travel back to 91 for a second. The first exploration deed is the Chambers of Bergenstall, which is right over here. This is the Burial Cave of Bergenstall. It's a labyrinth of tunnels and chambers, and the goal is to find all 12 chambers, so I'm going to run through them in one fell swoop here. I'm going to pick up a few repeatable quests in here just so they're not clogging up my screen, but I've already done them in the playthrough. So you can follow along, and I will show you all 12 chambers in a very smooth fashion. This is the first chamber of Bergenstall in the southeast corner. This is the second chamber of Bergenstall here towards the south. This central area is the third chamber of Bergenstall. Towards the west. This here is the fourth chamber of Bergenstall. This clearing is the fifth chamber of Bergenstall. Here towards the north is the sixth chamber of Bergenstall. Now to access the other ones, I'm going to go down one level into the lower depths of this maze. This central area is the seventh chamber of Bergenstall. Down here is the 8th Chamber of Bergenstall. Down here towards the west is the 9th Chamber of Bergenstall.
And this corner is the 10th chamber of Bergen style. Let me make sure I go north first. This is the end of the instance here, but this is considered the 11th chamber of Bergenstahl, so not the 12th. So finally, let's head on to the 12th and final chamber of this labyrinth. Here is the 12th and final chamber of Bergenstau, and that concludes the deed for exploring all 12 chambers. The next exploration deed is Eastwall Explorer. The cliffs and tree-clad slopes of this hilly region serve as the eastern boundary of the Kingdom of Rohan and the northernmost reach of the Kingdom of Gondor today. The first landmark is Mansig's encampment. This camp of Rohirrim hail primarily from the Wold, but there are representatives from throughout the Kingdom of Rohan. They come to the East Wall under the command of Mansig. Their purpose was to investigate the fresh gathering of orcs and uruks that crossed the river, but they were ambushed upon arrival and still work to recover from that attack. The next landmark is the Dead Orc Glade. More than a dozen orcs lie dead in a glade not far from Amon Hen. What happened here? Next is Parth Gollan. This grassy lawn of Parth Gollan would serve as a good location for the campsite of any traveler forced to disembark the river, but it is in full view of the far shore and could be dangerous. Next is the Tindrock. The Tindrock is a great spur of rock that divides the waters of the Enduin as they rush towards the Falls of Raros. Called Toll Brandir by the Elves, it is said to be unclimbable. Next is the Falls of Raros. The Great Falls of Raros descend from the cliffs with a booming roar. To follow the river over the edge means death. Next is Amon Hen. Amon Hen is one of the two hills that rise on either side of the Anduin at the Falls of Raros. The kings of old once sat upon the seat of seeing at the summit and saw many things to use to them. Next is the Sutcroft's Barricade. The orcs of the East Wall have erected a barricade to keep travelers from coming into the East Wall from the Sutcrofts. The final three landmarks are in the tunnels beneath the East Wall. The North Guard is a chamber dominated by the Orcs of Moria in the tunnels beneath the East Wall. Next is the Hissing Pit. This chamber is full of Gredbig. It is possible that other tunnels beneath the East Wall are infested with these creatures as well.
Finally, there is the South Guard. This is the southernmost chamber of the tunnels beneath the East Wall, and it is full of orcs from Moria. The next exploration deed is the Eaves of Fangorn Exploration, to explore Fangorn. The first landmark is the Silken Hold. The Silken Hold is overrun with evil spiders who snuff out the light with their webs, much to the displeasure of the trees who live there. Next is the Black Heart. Deep in the deepest reaches of Fangorn's eaves is a dark stretch of forest covered by shadows old and strong. The next landmark is the Hail Gap. A mossy set of tall stones runs along the edge of the Entwash River in Fangorn. The rocks green and lovely from the clear water they drink. Next is the Sweetmead. The Meadow of Sweetmead is appropriately named, for in the midst of the thick trees is a meadow smelling of gentle honey and sweet sunlight. Finally, there is the Fogwater. A large, deep pond stands still in the midst of Fangorn, treacherously hiding under its thick veil of fog. You cannot help but wonder how many unsuspecting creatures have drowned in the hidden depths. The next exploration deed is Enemies of the Rohirrim to explore the encampments of Rohan's enemies. The first landmark is Olgakosh. Ogakosh is a small easterling camp in the Wold. Next is Joshkin Orda. Joshkin Orda is a large easterling encampment of the Wold, where the Suthtor was captured by Nazgul to pave the way for the enemies of the Rohirrim. Next is Ninstazg. The orcs of Ninstazg rally for an attack on Floodwind. Next is Eastman's lair. The brigand leader Eastman has been exiled many times, but his lair always seemed to reappear somewhere in the northern world. Next is the South Undeep. The shallows of the Endwind present a vulnerable spot for the world, for Easterlings attempt to creep across the river at such places. Next is Kufuzg, a company of Urukai warriors who had marched west with a larger force, has recently returned and made camp in Ethangles. What could have caused them to flee eastwards? Next is the White Hand War Camp. A group of White Hand Orcs, the Ninkai, have established a war camp in the mountain passes between the Norcrofts and the East Wall. 
planning to assault the farming village of Faldham. Next is Ashturub. The orcs that have escaped the Wallstall spears in the East Wall have set up camp at Ashturub in the Sutcrofts, blocking Wallstall from receiving any aid from Snowborn. Next is Ufum Mao. Along the Ashturub, the orcs of Ufum Mao prevent Wallstall from receiving aid from Snowborn. Next is Krosh Balum. Half orcs of the White Hand have been actively trying to sack Garsfeld, having met minimal resistances from Gizil's men. Next is Maustazg. The orcs and orcs of Maustazg pose a direct threat to the people of the Entwash Vale. Finally, there is Thrug Unur. You have come across Thrug Unur, an encampment of Moria goblins in the Antwash Vale. Having goblins as neighbor is a situation that is less than ideal for the Rohirrim here. The next exploration deed is Farms and Crofts of the East Eminent to discover the farms of the East Eminent. The first landmark is Rangar's farm. This small farm belongs to the farmer Rangar, who has refused to evacuate despite the growing danger of the orc threat. Next is the Springview Estate. This estate was once home to a prosperous farming family, but it has fallen into the greedy hands of the invading orcs. Next are the Desolate Crofts. The Crofts of Wallstyle, ravaged almost completely beyond saving, are held by orcs, so what few crops remain are far too dangerous for any crofter to harvest. Next is Bradcroft. Bradcroft is the largest croft of the Sutcrofts and lies south of Garsfeld. It is currently overrun and has been destroyed by a number of half-orcs and orcs. Finally, there is Rything. Rything is a largely untouched spread of croftland surrounding Snowborn. The orcs have made attempts to besiege them, but so far their efforts have been repelled by the forces of Snowborn. The next exploration deed is the Nurseries of the Wormdelf here in Wormdelf. The Wormdelf, layer of a horde of drakes, hosts numerous nurseries and breeding caves. So I am going to take you through the entire maze here and show all of these nurseries. There are five of them. So enjoy the ride. Hopefully I don't get too lost. This here is the first nursery of Wormdelf.
This is the second nursery of Wormdorf. This here is the third nursery of Wormdelf. This is the fourth nursery of Wormdelf. I think I got a little lost here, sorry guys. As per usual Renaissance gaming fashion, I thought I almost made it, but let me get on over to this last fifth nursery, which is right here. This is the fifth and final nursery of Wormdelf. The next exploration deed is ruins, tombs, and monuments of the East Eminent to discover the ruined places of the East Eminent. The first landmark is the Duolong Hole. The dead stir in the barrows of the Duolong Hole in the Wold. Never a good sign to the men of Rohan who are naturally superstitious. Next is the Wadscroffin. The Wadscroffin is home to the dead who walk. Though they should be asleep in their tombs, what wakes the sleeping Draugar from their rest? Next is the Seething Mire. The Seething Mire lies near Langhold, once a fair Gondorian structure, now not but ruins overrun by salamanders and their nests. Next is Minas Rant. A freestanding stone tower, Minas Rant is a relic of the ancient armies of Gondor that once protected the lands now called the Norcrofts. Next are the Red Fields. The Red Fields were once ideal lands for growing crops and raising livestock, but became primarily battlegrounds of the first of the recent orc invasions. The area received its nickname due to the bloodshed incurred by mounted orc archers. Next is Dagred's Grave. You have found the grave of the father of Fastred, the previous reeve of the Sutcrofts. Fastred often visits to pay his respects and to mercilessly hunt any orc that dare stray too close to his father's resting place. Next is the city in ruin. A loss for Thornhope, newly arrived upon the list of the dead and abandoned places of the East Eminent. Thornhope was a thriving city once, but now it is not but death and ruin. A hollow reminder of the good people that lived there.
Next Thursday, Ancient Tomb. Tombs of the men of Gondor can sometimes be found in secluded corners of Rohan. Such crypts often attract adventurers who seek treasures of the Second Age, but they are frequently filled with only danger and death. Next is Bergenstau. Bergenstau was once an ancient burial tomb belonging to the ancestors of the Dunlingdings. Now it teems with evil in the form of the Draugar. Finally, there is Earl's Hollow. This memorial to Earl the Young stands in the world as a reminder to the greatest deeds in Rohan's history. Earl's monument stands here, but his tomb is near Edoras. The next exploration deed is the defenses of Eastern Rohan to explore the defenses of Rohan. The first landmark is the Undeep Watch. The Undeep Watch is where the Rohirrim of Langhold keep watch upon the ford against the crossing of Easterlings. Next is Feldberg. Feldberg is a defense outpost of Harwick, presided over by Captain Agelmund. Next is Wakenflood. Wakenflood, a Rohirrim outpost of the Wold, has nearly fallen to the Easterlings. Soldiers lie wounded as they struggle to uphold the defenses. Next is Twickenburg. Twickenburg is the Rohirrim watch upon the crossroads in the Wold, ensuring that the roads are held by the free peoples. Next is North Tor. North Tor is the Rohirrim's last defense against the Easterlings in the enemy's march upon Floodwind. Next is Catabran's camp. The huntsman Catabran has set up camp within a rock formation to hunt on behalf of Reef Athelward. Next is the Western Cliving Watchtower. The men of the Western Watchtower are the vanguard of the defense of the city of Cliving. From their outposts, they are able to identify enemy forces approaching from the plains and are able to halt their intrusion. Next is the Rohirrim Training Grounds. Reeve Outerward's men have converted a secluded farmstead in the northeast into a training ground for aspiring soldiers. A relatively hidden location offers some protection from the Orc Assault. Finally, there is the Trader's Outpost. The merchants and traders at this outpost sell much needed supplies to travelers along the road and to those fleeing from the invading Orc armies. Their location is a dangerous one, but hired guards help to protect the traders from wandering enemies. The next exploration deed is the Wilds of the East Eminence to explore the wilds of Rohan. The first landmark is the Stinging Bog. The Stinging Bog lies just beyond the walls of Harwick in the Wold. Next is Krakabor. Krakabor is the highest hill in the Wold, looking out over the grassy plains.
Next is the Croft Watch. The Croft Watch is rumored to be the fairest and most scenic place in the Sutcrofts. Next is the Wad Fen. The Wad Fen is a wetland in the Entwash Vale, plagued by salamanders and madness inducing Draugar. Finally, there is the Wild Horse Herd. Wild Horse has run free in the lands of Rohan, and one particular herd of these impressive beasts can be found in the Entwash Vale. The final exploration deed is where evil creatures dwell to explore the dwellings of evil creatures in Rohan. The first landmark is the Howling Wood. The Howling Wood is a warg den in the wold that was once a strategic work site for Floodwind, but is now overrun with filthy, deadly beasts. Next is Fang Point. Fang Point is a warg camp that threatens the men of Feldberg, who stand watch on the road. Next is Umbal's Den. Umbal. The renowned and feared wolf matron makes her home in a circle of cliffs and rocks near the stream that runs across the Norcrofts. She and her offspring have caused no shortage of suffering to the nearby farmers. Next is the Valley of the Lath Bear. A once peaceful valley spanning from west of Faldholm into East Wall has become overrun with dangerous sloth bears. Next is Wormdelf. You have discovered Wormdelf, a cave teeming with evil drakes in the Entwash Vale. Such places are deadly even for the hardiest and bravest of warriors. Next there is Fang Tor, the worm father of Wormdelf lives upon the high rock of Fang Tor in the Entwash Vale. Next there are the Slayer Deeds, and the first one is Ancient Evil Slayer, and the best way to do this is over here in the Ancient Tombs, just circling up and killing all of these whites. Next is the Beast Slayer Deed, and in my opinion, the best place to get this done at is going to be here in Umbal's Den. You can round up all these raccoon-looking wolves and kill them fairly quickly to count for the Beast Slayers. Next, there is the Boar Slayer Deed. And the best place to get this done at is just south of Harwick. There is a big concentration of boars around here. Very simple to just round them up and butcher them into pork loin. Next is the Brigand Slayer Deed. And one of the best places to get this done at is going to be here at Eastman's Lair. There are plenty of brigands to go around. They're pretty low level. It's quick work. Next is Dragonkind Slayer, and these salamanders do count as dragon types, so this is the best place to get this done at just because there are so many of these salamanders here in these ruins, and this deed does go by pretty quickly. Next is the Half Orc Slayer deed, and this spot in the north reaches of Snowborn is the best place. These are a little bit higher level, so this deed does take a little longer, but they're well concentrated here. Next is the Orc Slayer deed, and forgive me if my level has changed here. I had to go back and re-record this, because I missed it when I was recording this finale episode, but anyways, 
One of the better places to do this at is here in Ninstazg. There's lots of orcs around here, and they're low level, very quick to kill them and rack up the Slayer. Next, there is the Slayer of Mounted Enemies, and this deed kind of sucks because you got to do mounted combat, but it's not too bad here in this spot just north of Faldhum. There are plenty of mounted enemies here, as you can see, and you can just kind of ride around and destroy them. It takes a little time, but it's a good area for it. Next is the Spider Slayer Deed, and the best spot for this is here in the Silken Hold in Fangorn. And these little spiderlings are the best because as you kill one, more of them spawn, so you can get multiple kills once you find one of these, and they're basically one-hit shots. There's also some of these spinners and weavers around, so this is an overall perfect place for it. Next is the Uruk Slayer Deed, and in my opinion, one of the better places to do this at is going to be in Amon Hen, or the hills surrounding it. There are a few camps here with Urukai. It's not as concentrated as some of the other Slayer Deeds, but it gets the job done fairly quickly. Finally, there is the Warg Slayer Deed. And the best spot for this is going to be south of Harwick here in Fang Point. Plenty of wargs to go around. There's a few different little camps of wargs here. So it doesn't take too long to do this one. Okay, and finally, to finish up this episode, I do want to talk about the reputation factions here in Eastern Rohan, of which there are four, the main four factions that we helped in Hitbold. So they are the Men of the Antwash Vale, the Suckcrofts, the Norcrofts, and the Wold. And so for the Men of the Wold, they are led by their Reeve Harding, Aldor, of all the East Eminents. They are, are, they are at the forefront of the lines preparing to hold back the invasion of Easterlings coming down out of the Brownlands. Then we have the men of the Norcrofts. They are led by Reeve Atherward. They are stirring slowly to defend the East End from orcs and other foul enemies. The men of the Suckcrofts, led by their Reeve Fastred, are continually at odds with mortar orcs coming out of the cliffs of the East Wall. And finally, the men of the Entwash Vale, led by the Reeve Ingbert, prepare to defend against a siege of orcs out of Moria, though they are crippled by Theoden's edict that orcs should not be hunted in the Riddermark. So there's really not that many exciting things that you can barter for once you're kindred with them. And I will show you a little bit of that just here. So right here in Snowborn, right outside of the Mead Hall, there are these three gentlemen here who barter things depending on your reputation standing with the four different factions here in Eastern Rohan. There are three more of these guys in Harwick that give the same rewards. I just find this one a little bit easier to get to just here in Snowborn. So anyways, let me kind of show you what they can These give you. Lands are not to be traveled lightly. So depending on your standing, you may be able to barter for different forms of these things. So this guy, as you can see, he gives you different armors, light, medium, heavy, all the way from level 76 to 83. So nothing too exciting. You can kind of scroll through those, see if one of them is an upgrade for it you. It is wise for wanderers to equip themselves well. This guy gives you a little bit more interesting things like shields and pocket items, I believe, weapons, all that kind of stuff. There's also jewelry that he gives you, and I believe I actually I actually may have taken some of the jewelry from him. I don't know. I can't remember. But anyways, that's that. And then finally, this third guy has a it little bit more interesting things. To equip themselves well. So he does give you some cosmetic cloaks. You can kind of see what they look like. Eh, they're kind of ugly in my opinion. But anyways, there are some legendary upgrades as well. And crafting recipes, which I think I used for some of my new equipment. And then there's this miscellaneous tab. You definitely want to come here. Because if you're a hunter, you can get Guide to Snowborn. That way you can travel back here quickly. Or if you are a warden, then you can get Muster. 
in Snowborn, so I'm going to barter for that. And then also Return to Snowborn, I believe everybody can use. And I'm just going to get that too, just because... And you can see those skills are now in that little hot bar. I'm just going to drag them off for now. And then finally, there's this row here. Uh, excuse me. And then finally, there's this Rohiric Fishing Rod. And my current Fishing Rod is... A well-crafted Lebethron Fishing Rod. And it gives me plus 5 Fishing Skill. But this Rohiric one gives you 8. So I'm going to go ahead and get it, because that's a little bit of an upgrade for me. I'm going to finally destroy my Fishing Rod. And now I got my new one. Alright, so that's really all that's worth demonstrating here. So... That's that for reputation in East Rohan. That is it. That is the end of probably the hardest season I've recorded. I always thought Moria was going to be the hardest one, but this one beat Moria, believe it or not. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed the season. I apologize again that it took so long. I appreciate your patience and continued support for the series, and I'll see you next season in Wildermore.